Hi there, everyone. I'm Dave Owens with the San Ramon Arts Foundation, and welcome to the first virtual film event. Tonight, we'll be talking about Meet John Doe, Frank Capra's 1941 classic about media sensationalism and the dark side of populism. And we're pleased to have Professor Joseph McBride join us. If the audience has any questions for Professor McBride, please, please write your questions in the comments section, or you can use the hand feature on Zoom if you want to uh, speak. Uh, do know that the event is being recorded, though. Now I'm going to turn it over to Patrick, who's going to talk about the Arts Foundation. Thanks, Dave. And I'm Patrick Gutierrez. I'm also with the Arts Foundation. And I'm very excited to be here. Thank you all for being here for our first show. This is very exciting. Uh, and thank Professor McBride for being here. A quick plug about the foundation before we get started. We exist to encourage, support, and promote the arts in San Ramon and the San Ramon Valley, whether that's the visual arts, music, dance, poetry, theater, or film. Uh, just some of the many things we have uh, supported are the Utility Box Project, funding for cultural and dance programs, and we're proud of our Jumpin' at the Sun professional dance company. Please help us continue to grow our work towards elevating the arts in our community. You can always make a donation on our website at sanramonarts.org. Uh, the San Ramon Arts Foundation is a 501c3 organization. Now let's get to the fun part, the movie. I absolutely enjoyed this film. It was, it was excellent. I hope you did too. Uh, it, the performances by uh, Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck were, were, they're two of my favorite actors and they were amazing. So hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, now I'm gonna kick it over to my co-host Dave to uh, tell us a little bit about Professor McBride's background. Dave? Absolutely, Patrick. So as I said, we're honored to have Professor Joseph McBride with us tonight. Professor McBride has taught at San Francisco State University since 2002 and has written or edited 21 books, two of them on Frank Capra. Frank Capra, The Catastrophe of Success, and frankly, The Unmasking of Frank Capra. He has also written books on Howard Hawks, John Ford, Orson Welles, and Steven Spielberg, pretty good list of directors. He also worked with the great Orson Welles playing a film critic in The Other Side of the Wind. So as research for this event, I read The Catastrophe of Success. And I gotta say, it was impeccably researched and I learned a lot, not just about Capra, but the Italian American uh, experience, uh, old Hollywood, uh, the House of Un-American Activities Committee, uh, World War II propaganda films, and much, much more. So I highly recommend that you check it out if you like this film. Okay, so I'm, me and Patrick are gonna start off with a few questions. And then if you have any questions, let us know. And hopefully uh, we're mostly listening to you guys. So first question, Professor McBride. In your book, you say, like John Doe, Capra lived with anxiety about what would happen if the public came to realize that he was not the man they thought he was. Yeah. Reading your book, it's clear that Capra is a more complicated person than the public thought. Can you elaborate on this and maybe how that plays into Meet John Doe? Yeah, thank you for, for having me. It's really nice to be with you and um, great to talk to everybody. Um, yeah, Capra was a fascinating man. Uh, I knew him well and um, I spent seven and a half years writing the biography and I spent uh, about a year interviewing him. Uh, and then he had a series of strokes so I couldn't interview him after that. But I, I knew him, I met him in 1975. I guess this is a good way to start because when I first met him, I, I've always been a big Capra fan, I still am. And I just saw Meet John Doe again last night, really enjoyed it. Um, he's one of my favorite directors, uh, uh, but when I met him, I was kind of taken aback because in 1975, I was on Variety and I was interviewing every director I could meet that I admired. And I went down to Palm Springs to uh, where he lived and we went to a very posh country club and he was, uh, he's a very charming guy. And he was giving me his whole big Frank Capra rap about how he hated bankers and rich people. And he, you know, he's a populist <laughs> man of the people, et cetera. And this guy came over to our table wearing a sport coat and everything. And he was, had these photographs. He said, Frank, here are the photos of you playing golf with President Ford. And so he shows us these pictures and Capra's saying, oh God, this is so great. You know, Jerry's such a funny guy. And uh, when he hits the ball, it goes all over the place. <laughs> and there was one picture I remember vividly, uh, President was holding the pin for Capra while he putted. And I thought that's kind of the ultimate immigrant fantasy. Capra was an immigrant from Sicily to have the president of the United States hold the pin for you when you putt. I mean, that's the kind of thing I used to do as a golf caddy, you know. <laughs> and so Capra was going, oh man, you know. So then the guy took them away and he said, I'll, I'll make copies and get them to you next week, you know. And Capra said, thanks. And, and then he turned to me and he said, where was I? I said, oh, I was telling you how I hate bankers and rich people. And I thought, whoa, this is, this guy is contradicting himself. This is not, he's not the man 
he seems to be. Um, you know, he's uh, he has he had an attraction to power and rich richness and and success, and that's you know part of why I called the book The Catastrophe of Success, which is a title I borrowed from Tennessee Williams when he did Streetcar Named Desire made him, well, actually, he wrote it at the time Streetcar opened. It was an uh, essay for the New York Times, but he was writing about the tremendous success that fell on him when he did Glass Menagerie. And he called it the catastrophe because all kinds of things happened that he didn't expect that were bad. And he had trouble coping with it, as a lot of people do. And um, so I, I was kind of taken aback by Capra's um, duplicity and dual nature, let's say. And so I, I made kind of a mental note, find out more, you know, and I was alerted to that. And then in 1981, 82, I wrote the AFI American Film Institute Life Achievement Award show uh, honoring Capra with the producer, George Stevens Jr. So I got to know Capra quite well then uh, and the people he worked with. Part of my job was to run around and uh, talk people into being on the show. And a lot of people, didn't want to be on the show because they, they didn't get along with him like Claudette Colbert and he were um, had had a falling out so I had to go to New York and persuade her to be on the show and she came and was very gracious and um, Betty Davis etc but um, in the course of that I was writing Capra's acceptance speech with him and for two months I'd go down to Palm Springs and work with him which was fascinating and I'd rehearse it over and over again because the, our producer said, you know, the show will rise and fall on, 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 on his speech because he's not a great public speaker. He would kind of look down a lot and he would mumble and, he, you know, it was um, uh, English was his second language and he had some trouble articulating things. And, uh, you know, I mean, that wasn't his job. He was a great director, but he wasn't a great speaker. But anyway, so uh, George said, make, make the speech as good as possible. So we, we turned it into what I thought was a terrific speech. And um, it was very moving and very funny and um but we rehearsed it over and over and over and uh then we'd go to dinner and have long talks and i got to know him well and as i got to ask him a lot of questions and when he did the speech uh it went over like gangbusters and liz smith the, the gossip columnist wrote in her column that she said i haven't cried so much since bambi's mother died i love that <laughs> <laughs> that's when he told the story of coming to america with his family of immigrants. I, I always love immigrant stories of any kind. And, and so in my book, I, I wrote extensively about his parents and his older brother who brought them to America and Frank's uh, uprooting from Italy, Sicily, and his, you know, struggle to become an American, etc. But anyway, um, I began thinking, there's a book in this man, because the stories I was hearing from other people were not much like his autobiography. He wrote a autobiography that was called the name above the title that everybody loved including me you know it's, it's a very beguiling book but i realize it's um, largely a work of fiction uh, it's like a novel about hollywood beguiling but untrue and he rewrote his life like a frank capra film basically because he was at a very low ebb his career what i was really most interested in as a capra fan was he had tremendous success until um World War II, and then he went in the army and made propaganda films. He came back, he made It's a Wonderful Life, which was, uh, you know, his last great film, but also his last good film. And after that, his career went downhill drastically, and I was wondering what caused that. So the first half of his life, tremendous success. Second half, tragedy, really. I mean, a very sad story, a collapse, creative collapse, and I wondered what's the answer to this. And, and so, um, uh, I, I began thinking about doing a biography, and then in 1984, I decided to quit writing uh, screenplays and TV shows and dedicate myself to writing books full time, which I enjoyed more because you're more your own boss. So I went to Wesleyan University where he had his papers, and I was the first person to see them. And I, what I was interested in in his autobiography, there was a, in 1951. He writes about going to India to represent the US government at a film festival. And it was a very strident passage of anti communism. He was saying, I was there to attack the commies and, you know, represent America. And it just seemed out of keeping with the capper we know and love, who portrayed himself as a humanist and man who loved everybody and all that. And, and so I thought, I'll look at the box for 1950. I asked for the box for 1951. They hadn't opened the boxes yet. So I got the box, and within 10 minutes, I had the story that in 51, he was a member of a, a think tank at Caltech, 
uh, and he had a tough, he had a sec high security clearance. And they were planning strategy for World War III in Europe. And he was the head of psychological warfare unit, planning all kinds of kind of crazy ideas to propagandize if we're going to have a war with Russia. And um, his security clearance was was denied, which was a terrible shock to him, the worst shock in his life, because nobody was more patriotic than Frank Capper. He loved America as an immigrant. He came to love. At first, he didn't, but then he just embraced America because of all the opportunities he was given. And uh, so here the government had uh, called him a traitor basically. And this was the Red Scare period. And um, he had left Hollywood because of it. I found out he worked with a lot of left-wing writers, communists, uh, progressives, liberals. And he also worked with moderates and conservatives. He worked with the whole spectrum. and. One of his close aides told me that's what made him good. And this relates really to meet John Doe because you can see a lot of all kinds of political uh, complexities in that film. Um, what made him good was he could listen to all these different points of view and then take from it what he wanted, you know? And, and uh, um, that's why his films are sort of confusing to critics. People had a hard time figuring out, is he a leftist? Is he a conservative? What is he? You know, in the same film, you'll get different points of view. Anyway, so he, um, what I found out very quickly was he was accused of various things, some of which were absurd, like you were supportive of Russia during World War II. Well, they were our allies and he was making propaganda films for our, our government. Why wouldn't he be supportive of Russia? Uh, and they said that he got propaganda literature from Russia. Well, yeah, he was making film filmed the Battle of Russia. But one of the one of the charges was accurate. It said you worked with a lot of left wing writers. Um, but you know, that's no crime. Uh, the blacklist was unfair, because in America, we have the right to belong to any political party we want or have any political opinion we want. We don't have the right to overthrow the government or try to as recently happened. But you can be any political party. Uh, and that's protected. But they were persecuting somebody for being a communist or even being a so-called communist sympathizer if somebody said you were a member of um, uh, the ACLU or some civil rights organization you were a suspect or whatever and so Capra Capra panicked and what he did was I found out he turned in uh, seven of his colleagues he informed on them to the Army Navy uh, Army Navy Air Force Personnel Security Board which was one of these clearance boards operating for the government we think of the Hollywood blacklist that was run by Hollywood, but the, the government was um, persecuting a lot more people, a lot more people. And so he informed on his writers, he wrote a document justifying himself. So I made this discovery and that was really a shock because we, nobody knew that Capra was an informer in the blacklist period. Mm -hmm. and, and what I came to realize, it took a long time to get the whole story, but I mean, I had the basic story, but um, we all know that Ilya Kazan was, was an informer because he broadcast that proudly and but Capra hid it, you know, and it's an interesting question, who's the better person, the one who hides it or the one who proclaims it, you know, but in any case, it changes your view of Capra. So I was always interested in informers and why they, uh, what led them to turn in their friends and betray their friends. And also uh, Capra betrayed the principles of the constitution, which he, I valued Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is my favorite film, uh, Capra film. It defends the First Amendment and uh, very eloquently, and yet he betrayed it in his, his life. But I think what happened, to make a long story short, is he, he felt ashamed and guilty about it, and he kind of exiled himself from Hollywood, and he never made a good film again. And he announced that he'd never work with another liberal writer. And if you do that, you can't work with 99% of the writers in Hollywood, you know. Well, Robert so, Riskin, who uh, wrote, wrote this one. Yeah, he wouldn't work with Riskin, although they broke in 1941 after this film. Riskin was the guy who made the split. He went to England. He, he basically decided he didn't want to work with Capra, but it was mostly at the time because he wanted to work for the war effort. He went to London to volunteer his services, and then he came back and worked for the U.S. government making soft sell propaganda films with Phil Dunn. And Capra said, those damn writers shouldn't be making films, you know. Uh, but there was the whole authorship battle, which I think Meet John Doe, one of the most interesting things about that film is it's about authorship, among other things. Who wrote, who writes the speeches? Barbara Stanwyck. And Doe is this kind of naive, um, ignorant guy, good-hearted fellow, but he's been giving these speeches that have some covert political message. 
and he reads them and he says, I don't even read them before I give them because it's more fun that way. Yeah. And then when he gets in trouble, it's very interesting. He says, well, it's all because of Miss Mitchell here. She wrote the stuff. And that prefigured what Capra did when he got in trouble for, see, see what was most interesting was Capra was a social critic in the 30s and, and Meet John Doe is a strong work of social criticism in many ways because it's about domestic fascism. It's a warning. Uh, it's a pretty strong film, you know, and it was made in the year of Citizen Kane, which also dealt with uh, a Hearst-like character who had fascist impulses. And, um, but Capra was a social critic but I, I came to realize that that was due mostly to his liberal writers, Robert Riskin, Joe Swirling, and Sidney Buckman. Capra was a conservative, a lifelong Republican, which I found out. And he was very right wing, very anti-communist and um, um, hated Franklin D. Roosevelt. That was another big surprise. Mm -hmm. He's a guy who is considered the New Deal filmmaker and he, he voted four times against Roosevelt. He, could you imagine he voted for Herbert Hoover? Um, twice. He said from 1920 on, when he started voting, he voted the straight Republican ticket. So he voted for Herbert Hoover twice, uh, Alf Landon and Wendell Wilkie. He, he, and he told me he hated Roosevelt. And I said, why did you hate Roosevelt? And he said, because he was a rich kid. I hated him. And, and um, Claudette Colbert told me there was a party she gave and Life magazine was running pictures of Roosevelt's youth. And there was a picture of him as a little boy with uh, long hair in this sort of little Lord Fauntleroy costume in a pony cart, you know, and Capra was railing against uh, this. Oh, when he was doing this, I was selling newspapers on the street in LA and, you know, he was, he just hated him because of his privilege, you know, uh, but I think he hated him more because the tax rates were extremely high in that period. They were like 90%. Could you imagine today yeah. if people had to pay 90% of their taxes? And that's one of the reasons Meet John Doe uh, ran into problems. But anyway, I'm, I'm telling you a lot, but Capra was a very different guy from what we thought in answer to your question. In fact, I think Patrick wants to jump in here. And, uh, yeah, I just, yeah. Well, before, I, before I ask you my question, uh, one of my questions, Professor McBride, I just want to remind the audience or let the audience know to uh, type in the chat button uh, for their questions so we can ask Professor McBride them uh, or raise your hand and uh, we'll try to get to all your questions. So I know we're going to try to keep it to an hour. So we kind of got a, we got a lot of questions for you. Yeah, yeah, and I'll try to keep it shorter, but I wanted to kind of give you the preamble. No. Appreciate it. That's great background. Yeah, I see an open-ended question. It's my fault. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so, uh, Professor McBride, I heard there were four different endings for this movie that weren't actually used. So, can you tell us a little bit about that, and then also how Capra used the one that was actually in the movie at the end of the movie? Well, one of the big <laughs> problems in this film. This was based on a short story written in the twenties, and um, it it had been floating around Hollywood. Henry Hathaway, the well-known director, I interviewed him for the book about something else. And he said, by the way, did you know that I was offered Meet John Doe? And I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, I turned it down because of the ending. He said, there's no way to end this movie. It's an impossible ending because he paints himself into a corner because you don't want the guy to commit suicide. But if he doesn't commit suicide, there's no movie. And anyway, so Capra took it on and he had great trouble ending it. Uh, the, the myth is that he shot five endings, and that's not true. I, I um, read uh, I read in Capra's papers, since this is the first film he produced on his own with Robert Riskin, they formed a company called Frank Capra Productions. Mm -hmm. Riskin was upset, by the way, because he felt that he was being um, unfairly belittled in the press uh, for his contributions to Capra films. But when they decided to go independent, and have their own company. He wanted to call it Capra Riskin Productions and Capra said, no, we'll call it Frank Capra Productions. He really didn't like that. And Capra owns 65% of it and Riskin 35%. And that, Riskin was not happy about that. But um, um, this story was that they had five endings. And uh, I, 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 the point is I found the, the, a lot of script material at Wesley and, and Capra's papers. The, the more he was uh, independent, the more script material there is. The previous films, all I could find were the final versions, mostly with a few pencil notes, but um, uh, they had great trouble with the ending. They, uh, Barbara Stanwyck said, I only remember shooting two endings mm -hmm. and she was right. And I pieced it together. Um, he shot an ending in which the guy jumps and uh, uh, dies and he's cradled on the street by uh, Walter Brennan. And um, they showed that to a small preview audience and they didn't like that at all. They, uh, you know, they found that to be such a horrible bummer, you know, and then um, he shot a different ending. Well, he, he recut it so that 
Edward Arnold's character kind of has a change of heart and he begs John Doe not to jump. And then he, he says he's going to support the John Doe clubs and make them apolitical. And they actually, that was the ending the film opened with. And the, the audience and the critics thought this was terrible that this um, sinister guy would have this change of heart. They, th they didn't believe it at all. And uh, so then uh, Capra and Riskin were re-editing parts of it. Um, and the, Capra's story is sort of a myth that he got a letter from a guy who signed a John Doe who told him how to end the film, which is a wonderful story, but it's not totally true. I found I the letter. On the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I found the I found the actual letters. And the letter, there were two letters. One guy said, you know, we don't want him to jump because, you know, he, he betrays his, you know, we, we love the John Doe clubs and we don't want this guy to jump. He doesn't deserve to die. Um, somebody said about this film, it's a very American film to have a, a Christ who's uncrucified, you know. Um, it's a very, very religious, uh, Capra's work is full of Christian symbolism. This film is explicit about he's a Christ figure. But anyway, um, uh, what they did was, uh, the, oh, a letter came in, a second letter came in and it was directed to Riska, not Capra. And it was signed EGF, whoever that is. I could never figure out who that was, but the guy uh, or person, it, it was clear from the letter that the person knew Riska. And he said, why don't you have one of the John Doe's come forward and convince him not to jump, you know? And so Capra and Riskin thought, ah, that's a, that's a better ending. So they had Regis Toomey and the guy in the letter said Regis Toomey should, or actually he said one of the John Doe's and somebody had written in pencil, not Capra, but somebody had written Regis Toomey. If you remember in the film, he's the soda jerk who gives that wonderful speech in oh, the, mayor, yeah. the mayor's office is, is one of the highlights of the film. And when they shot that, the crew applauded, which doesn't happen very often. And at the press preview, the press applauded. He was so good. And he gives a very heartfelt, wonderful speech. And um, so they thought, we'll bring back this guy and his wife, Anne Duran, plays the part. And they, they, they arrive at the... Um, it, so they shot a scene of them driving to the city hall in, in the snow and then they they show up and they persuade him not to jump and barbara stanwick is crying and persuading him and so the the john does and barbara stanwick persuade him not to jump and uh it ends they, they shot the little bit where um uh the great james gleason the managing editor says uh, there you are norton the people uh, see if you can lick that you know good good ending line and and that was the ending that went out to the public so he was reshooting that and he was also re-editing parts of it he wasn't shooting five totally different endings that's the answer to that question the ending is i don't think is totally satisfactory but it kind of works you know and most of capra's endings are kind of unsatisfactory if you think about them too much um, yeah because um he's a very dark filmmaker and this film makes it clear uh, you know a lot of his films are about suicide and depression manic depression his heroes and Two of his films have characters who actually killed themselves, The Way of the Strong and uh, Bitter Tea of General Yen, and with the characters committing suicide. And so does It's a Wonderful Life, as somebody said, if you don't believe in angels, it's about a man committing suicide. <laughs> yeah. And Capra himself was suicidal a lot. He was a very moody guy, and I write about this a lot in my book. And late, late in life, when his career collapsed, he was seriously thinking of killing himself. And so that's, that's kind of a constant temptation. So... Um, he puts on these happy endings, though, because part of it was him. He wanted that upbeat finale, the kind of manic depressive thing. But also it was commercial in a sense, too. He felt you couldn't kill Gary Cooper, you know, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have an audience question uh, from uh, Joyce. So she actually asked how old Cooper and Brennan were in this, this film. And the answer is actually 40 and, and 47. They didn't have the same kind of diets that uh, actors have now today. But... She talks, she says that Walter Brennan is great in this movie, and he, and he is as the colonel. Can you maybe talk about um, his role in the movie and what he symbolizes? Yeah, there's, when I first started seeing Capra films, I was kind of thrown by something. You know, I, I love all the sentiment. I mean, I love the corn, Capricorn, as they call it, and the heartwarming stuff. But I noticed there was always some wise guy in the Capra films when they were having a heartwarming moment. Some He would cut to some wise guy character. Ned Sparks was the classic one. He was a sour faced comic actor. And throughout his films, there's a guy like that. And Walter Brennan fits that part. He's, he's the cynic. 
Yes. And so when they have a scene that's sort of mushy or sentimental, it'll cut to Walter Brennan scowling or shaking his head or making a snide remark. And um, it jarred me at first. And then I realized, oh, that's that's really integral to Capra's films because that's Capra's conflicted personality. What makes artists often good is ambiguity and conflict. You know, the greatest artists have complexities like that. And so Capra has... He loves the schmaltz, but he also loves the kind of deflating the schmaltz. And one of Robert Riskin's friends told me, a journalist friend, he said, uh, Bob provided, uh, Capra provided the schmaltz and Bob provided the acid. So maybe those kind of characters are Riskin kind of undercutting some of the schmaltz. But, you know, the schmaltz uh, would not work as well without some of the jabs of realism that a guy like the Colonel puts in. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's a pretty sensible guy, but he's too cynical in a sense. And, uh, uh, you know, he's trying to get him to leave all the time. He's, he's aware of, you know, the corruption he's getting into. But, um, you know, we're kind of hoping that Doe will go through with um, the, the, you know, the speeches and stuff. But, you know, he gets himself in, in a lot of trouble and causes all kinds of calamities. And But it, it winds up uh, uh, well enough in the long run. But uh, Capra's films are a balance between tragedy and comedy constantly and um, the endings are kind of um, somebody said they're imposed by force majeure you know they don't quite work uh, Sidney Bugman who wrote Mr. Smith Goes to Washington said he would always leave that film two minutes before it was over because the you know the real ending is when uh, Smith collapses in the Senate in defeat and then the senator, the other senator runs in and he's trying to kill himself, which is preposterous. And then uh, the, everybody kind of um, shouts and waves. And it's, it, it doesn't make any sense because his whole state is turned against him and he's lost his battle. But Capra imposes this uh, frantic, happy ending. Yeah. In, in the real film, he gets primary, right? So, uh, yeah. I, Patrick? So I have, we have a couple of audience <laughs> questions. One of them, um, a couple of people have asked about the... Uh, he wanted to know, will the film be shown? Nadine asked, will the film be shown or is it only in the conversation about the film? Uh, we had hoped, uh, Nadine, that you, would have, you had a, would have had a chance to watch it on Canopy or Amazon Prime beforehand. If you haven't, um, then we're discussing the movie. Uh, please do watch it when you can. Hopefully you'll still enjoy the discussion, but yeah. Um, and then another question, uh, this is uh, from the audience member to you, Professor McBride, and you've talked about it a little bit before, but maybe you can elaborate on it here for a few minutes. Uh, the question is, there's a very strong Christian view in the telling of the story, including Annie's line about the original John Doe. Can you speak to Capra's mm. views influencing this theme? Yeah, let me just say to Nadine and others that might be interested, you may notice that the film doesn't look super great compared to some of the other uh, Capra films. One one re problem was in the 30s when he worked for Columbia, Joe Walker, who was his cameraman, was a, a great cameraman. He told me Harry Cohn, who ran the studio, was so cheap he wouldn't preserve his films properly. And so a lot of the films had to be restored. But Me John Doe looks, uh, for a long time, it looked really bad. It looked really doopy and fuzzy because it fell in the public domain. Capra and Riskin, they made some money off it, but not very much. And then with the high taxes, they, they couldn't afford to uh, uh, hold on to the film. So they sold it in 1945 to some independent distributor who uh, let the negative deteriorate. And then he let the film go out of copyright. So it became a public domain film, which means anybody could release some crappy looking version of it. So for a long time, you saw these fuzzy looking versions. But in the 70s, the, the American Film Institute found some better prints and they tried to uh, put together a better version. And in, in recent years, they put together um, the best version you're going to see, but it's still kind of uh, not, doesn't look as great as it should have. George Barnes photographs was one of the best Hollywood cameramen, but that's one reason why uh, it doesn't look as sharp as some of the other Capra films. But uh, the Christian symbolism, yeah, Capra was very Christian. Uh, he was not a uh, staunch Catholic until the 50s when he had his uh, political uh, upheaval. He turned to religion as kind of his salvation. Um, he was raised as a Catholic. He's from Italy, and uh, but he was a um, Christian scientist for a while, and he was a uh, skeptic, and uh, he was married to a Jewish woman. His first wife was Jewish, and mm -hmm. then his second wife was Catholic. And, you know, I mean, he was not a staunch Catholic until the 50s, and then he became very Catholic. And one problem he had in the 50s was 
almost I read all the scripts that he was trying to sell and couldn't sell. And they're, most of them are religious stories, either Bible stories or stories with some kind of religious content. And they were kind of embarrassingly over the top uh, propagandistic. You know, there were a lot of Bible movies and things made in the 50s, but they were kind of soft sell religious things. Um, but he was pushing uh, kind of proselytizing through his films and, and Hollywood didn't want that kind of film really. But um, throughout his work, there's a kind of a Christian symbolism. His, his, his main characters are kind of Christ figures. They're, they're uh, persecuted and, and uh, crucified. Uh, Me, John, uh, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town is a good example. That's a wonderful film. He's a decent guy who gets persecuted for trying to give away his money to the poor like Jesus did, you know. Although this guy has 20 million, he keeps 2 million for himself. I don't think Jesus would have done that, but you know, he's a canny businessman. <laughs> but, but you know, he gets put in a mental hospital. He's judged insane for trying to help the poor. And it's kind of a New Deal film, although Ronald Reagan quoted that film when he was president because Deeds gives a speech saying that people should help themselves. And um, anyway, but to, before I get onto that, there's you see this in, in in capra films where the heroes are persecuted mr smith uh, undergoes a kind of crucifixion for his principles and a defeat but it's kind of a um what do you call it a moral victory that he endures we see him as a hero and then there's a resurrection theme in some of the films at the end of meet john doe you could say it's a kind of resurrection he's going to kill himself uh uh, so Capra uh, is attracted to uh, Christian symbolism, as is Steven Spielberg, oddly enough. I wrote a biography of him, and he's Jewish, right. and yet his work is just permeated with Christian symbolism, um, Christian themes. I think it's because he wanted to fit in with the majority. That's a little different from Capra, but not not totally different. They're both great popular artists who want to be um, accepted by the masses, and so they, they identify with the masses, and uh, America... Is, is not really a Christian nation as some people claim because we're, we're supposed to be a country of um, religious freedom and you can be anything you want. But, um, and, and the early uh, founders were not all Christians and you know some were atheists and some were of different sure. de denominations, but there's a strong Christian tradition in America and Capra was part of that. But he didn't necessarily believe in it. One of the things I found that was troubling and interesting in his films, he didn't actually believe in a lot of the themes of his work and here we get back to Doe. I mean, to me, my favorite example is American Madness, the first really political film he made, which was about the first film about the depression. He's considered the great depression filmmaker. It's about a bank president who's kind of a progressive guy who loans money to people on character. And Roosevelt was running in 32 on a policy of fluid currency. He wanted people to take their money out of tin cans in the house and spend it. It was good for the whole country and uh, banks were failing right and left and Columbia made this film to prop up the Bank of America, which was their main lender. And Capra at the time he made this fervent appeal for a fluid currency was keeping his money under his mattress and in tin cans under the bed. <laughs> so he just didn't believe in the theme of his film. And uh, so he's, he was a really a phony in a lot of ways. And the themes came from people like Riskin and Joe Swirling and Buckman was a communist when he wrote Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. He was a member of the Communist Party and Capra knew this. He was uncomfortable with it, but he went along with it. And, uh, you know, so there's some strong liberalism and leftism in the films. And yet there's this pull toward the right in some of the things. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that happens in Meet John Doe is um, it's sort of an anti-New Deal film, oddly enough, because it, it talks about the John Doe clubs are kind of a way of they say it's wonderful we're taking people off for relief and they even have a scene with some caricatured bureaucrat in washington who says this is terrible everybody's going off for relief you know and um, that was one of roosevelt's big programs was to helping the poor with um, you know i mean he had a lot of programs like social security and other things in the relief programs and uh, capra and other conservatives didn't like that at all because capra thought well hey i made it from you know very little uh, background. I made it. I, Capra was very rich. Made a million dollars in 1938, which is astonishing, really. Uh, he was one of the richest people in the country. And they thought, well, hey, you know, I, I got my money. Uh, I, I did it myself. Who cares about all those other people? So they didn't like the relief programs. Um, and um, 
so this film is is a, it, it reminds me of George H. W. Bush's Thousand Points of Light, if you remember that. And mm -hmm. when when they're showing the map where all the little pins are showing the John Doe clubs, I really thought of Bush. And what that was all about was dismantling the New Deal protections. Right. And, and, and let's say, saying, well, we'll leave it to private charities and churches to help the poor. The government doesn't have a responsibility. And, and it, it, yeah, it'd be wonderful if churches and private charities would help people, but you can't really rely on that because uh, it doesn't always work and it's not sufficient. So we need the government to kind of, at least if you're on the liberal side, you think the government should help people. Uh, but Capra didn't believe that. And, and you see that in this film. Yeah, so I just want to remind people if they want to ask questions to please use the chat feature or you can raise your hand uh, in Zoom. Use that feature uh, if you want to speak to uh, Professor McBride. So, you know, it's interesting. You talk about Capra not necessarily having a worldview or maybe it's a muddy worldview or a shifting worldview. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what's interesting in your book was how uh, Barbara Stanwyck, who's in this movie, who had worked with Capra before, is kind of effusive in her praise. So Capra did have something... Uh, as a director, especially with actors, can you maybe describe, you know, uh, despite what his maybe his worldviews were, why he was like such a great filmmaker? Yeah, I, I really, after seven and a half years of writing that book, and then I wrote another book on how I wrote that book and all the problems I had, I spent four years of legal battles to get the first book out because I had Capra's archivist at Wesleyan University and my own publisher, Knopf, was trying to stop my book and had to, you know, it's hard enough to write the book without fighting the legal battle. So I wrote this, it's a Kafka story. But what I finally concluded was he is a really great director of actors and that's really important. He was not a great visual stylist. Some of his films look great, but that's because of Joe Walker who shot 20 of his films and George Barnes was a great cameraman. You know, like the scene of the political convention in the rain is one of his greatest scenes. That's really a magnificent piece of filmmaking. Uh, but on his own, Capra was, uh, uh, the films before Walker and after 1941, uh, don't look very good, really. Well, a, a Wonderful Life looked good. He had three good cameramen, but he, he was not particularly good at visual style. And I interviewed the cameraman of State of the Union, and he said he was shocked at how, how little Capra had to say about well, how the film should look. You know, he really had no opinions. And, um, but, and he, his political view was muddled. I think part of the problem was he was smart enough to go to college. He knew that going to high school and college was his ticket to success. And that was not common in his youth in the yeah, early 90s. He went to Caltech, which wasn't he, Caltech then, but that, I was surprised by that. Yeah, he, was, he wanted to be a scientist and he got a good scientific education, but not a good political or sociological ed education. He, actually, he said he discovered poetry at Caltech. He had a great English teacher. And, uh, but he, he, was, he wanted to be a chemist and he started declining in his chemistry uh, classes because he wasn't good enough at that. And he told me late in life, he says, I wish I had become a scientist uh, rather than a film director, which was kind of stunning. And I ended the book. That, that was that. shocking towards the end of your book. I was yeah, that is shocking. He's, and I said, well, what, what kept you in it? He said, the audience kept me in it because I loved hearing people laugh at my films. And, uh, that they liked the film, but you know, I felt I could have done more as a scientist. He didn't value his own profession enough. He mm. wasn't a terribly good writer. He, he didn't have a great visual style. He was politically muddled, but he was a tremendous director of actors and he gave a lot of actors their starts. He would find an actor like say Gloria Graham was small part actor and he gave her a wonderful part in It's a Wonderful Life. And he, he, he he didn't totally discover Gene Arthur, but he really helped build her into a star. And Jimmy Stewart, uh, yes. he made him a star. And uh, Stanwyck, he gave some of her greatest roles. And actually, she was really foundering before he gave her a wonderful part in Ladies of Leisure, and he directed her five times. He understood people. You know, he really knew people. He was, he was a great audience. Orson Welles, what a director really is, is the audience. He supplies what's missing in the making of a motion picture. And when you see pictures of Capra on the set, he had that wonderful smile. He would really respond. The, uh, the actress felt very comfortable with him, and that's really important. And uh, one of his crew said, if an actor blew a line, Capra would pick up a nail next to his chair and drop it on the floor of the set and would make this clanging sound. And he'd say, oh, I'm sorry, we got to do it yeah. again. Anything, as, as the crew guy said, anything to take the onus off the actor, you know. And he just loved actors and he understood the complexity of people and he, he was great with humor. And so um, 
He's Stan, Stanwick is just marvelous in his films. Gary Cooper, oh my God, what a, I mean, he's always a good actor, but he's so wonderful. And for example, the scene in the mayor's office when Toomey comes in and gives a speech, Cooper has no lines really, but his face is so marvelous and you can see all these complex changes and expressions going on. And that's partly Capra and partly Cooper, but Capra made all that come alive. And so you get great performances, Jimmy Stewart and wonderful life you know and Donna Reed is wonderful and that's his real talent but he also had great writers and cameramen that he could rely on for most of his career too. Absolutely. Speaking of the actors great segue here Professor McBride tell us about the casting who else was considered for the two lead roles um, and if the movie was remade today you know Hollywood remakes everything is remade <laughs> today who would you see playing um, Gary Cooper's role you know uh, and Barbara Stanwyck's? Well, you know, uh, when he made Mr. Smith, um, he was thinking of Gary Cooper and Gene Arthur, and he called it Mr. Deeds Goes to Washington. Then he changed it to Jimmy Stewart because he said to me, Jimmy was the highly educated guy who went to Princeton. He said he could deal with an idea. Then he said, Gary Cooper was wonderful, but he wouldn't know an idea unless it hit, hit him over the head. <laughs> And so, but when it came to uh, Meet John Doe, he thought of Jimmy Stewart and Gene Arthur because those were his favorite actors. But then um, for whatever reason, he began thinking, well, let's do something different. And oddly enough, the first actor he thought of was Ronald Coleman, who's a great actor who started in Lost Horizon, but he doesn't seem right for a common man because he seems like such a kind of a cultured uh, kind of um, guy with this beautiful, you know, uh, stage train speaking voice and so he quickly came to the gary cooper idea but it, they had to make a special deal warner brothers had to make a deal to get him from sam goldwyn but he wanted ann sheridan to play the female role and he couldn't get her for some contractual reason and then there was oh, olivia de Havilland. he tried to get her several times for films and she was a wonderful actress yes and then he fell back on barbara stanwyck oddly enough but you know when, when a film is good you kind of can't imagine anybody else in those parts and stanwyck is so good and she's you know she played that tough woman with a veneer of goodness and sweetness underneath and she said a great comment i asked her about it she gave it to somebody else she said um um at one point, so oh, Capra said about her that um, Jean Arthur was a very vulnerable actress. You know, she always seemed very anxious and everything, but Stanwyck had had a hard life. She'd been in nightclubs when she was young and kicked around. And But he said she could give you the burst of emotion better than anybody else, the deep feeling, you know. And I asked Stanwyck about that and she said, yes, yes. She said, that's Capra. He really understood people. And she said, one thing about him is he loved women. And she said, I don't mean in a sexual lecherous way, but she said, most directors are afraid of women. And I can, I know a lot of directors like that. Um, but she said, there are very few directors that really like women. And Capra was one of them. He loved actresses and he gave them great parts. And so she was very grateful to him. And she made five really good films with them. Uh, Bitter Tea of General Yen is a, a masterpiece. Uh, that's so great. But Ladies of Leisure, the first film she did for him, she plays a prostitute and she's so good in that film. It made her an instant star. And I talked to her about that and she said, um, you know, I thought if I'm gonna play a prostitute, I'm gonna be really good at what I do. You know, she wasn't judging the character and, and kind yeah. of being moralistic. I'm gonna be good at my job, you know, I'm just, uh, just, you know, and that's, She's a good journalist in Mi She 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 is maybe deficient to some extent in some of her principles, but she comes around and part of the story is her uh, having a conversion to realize that she's being corrupted and she should stand up for what's right and, and uh, stand up to her employer. But it's very convincing, her desperation. Somebody said Capra portrays poverty is a form of desperation, which it was for a lot of people in the 30s. And that comes across strongly. She's so desperate to keep her job. She makes up very quickly, very smart, this whole fraudulent story. So it's about a fraud and a fake. And Capra said once, um, he said, you know, if, if, you, if you build up people's hopes and illusions and make them believe in something, and then they find out you're a fake, the people are very, very angry at you. And that's what happened, I think, in his life. I mean, I revealed this in my book and it disillusioned a lot of people. And some people are angry at me for revealing this stuff, but Capra was 
a fake, you know, in a sense. He was a talented man who lied a lot. Didn't he could have given credit to other people? It isn't that hard to give credit if you're if you're all if you're at all generous. But he claimed he did it all, and um, he just made up all kinds of stories and twisted reality. And uh, he was uh, uh, he, he pretended to he, he he pretended to be a kind of a liberal humanist in his later years because that's what the young audience my age wanted to hear you know he would go around to colleges but in fact he was this uh, bigoted uh, reactionary uh, i mean i talked to him a lot about different ethnic groups you name an ethnic group he hated them i mean it was kind of shocking when oh. one, re one review said it was really a shocking book because he says the worst things about any ethnic group you could name blacks uh, jews um, irish people um, uh, Latinos, you name them, even his own people, the Italians, he, I mean, he was a misanthrope, really, and ironically, people thought of him as a Gandhi-like lover of humanity, and couldn't have been more false, you know, and so, but where, the, part of the mystery and interest in this book is, where, where did this guy come from with these films that make you love these characters and these warm portraits of people? Well, I think he could tap into the better side of his nature. I think we're, we're, People, all of us have parts, you know, we have parts that are benevolent, parts that are nasty, and we're all mixtures of that. We're not, nobody's perfect, you know. And so Capra had parts and he could tap into his better parts with the help of good writers and good actors and, yeah. and, uh, and the audience. Uh, and yet there's some nasty stuff in his films and some, you know, like the way he portrays black people is always bad. Of course, yeah. Very, very caricatured, even in Meet John Doe, he can't resist caricaturing the black janitor at the end of the film and having fun at his expense, you know, and um, it's, it's not, you know, you wonder, isn't this a film about the so-called common man? I mean, one of the ironies is that he's supposed to be the director of the common man. He, he had a good line. He said, I didn't think he was common. I thought he was a hell of a guy, which is interesting. It's a compliment, but it's also kind of a contradiction because yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, got, he's got to be extraordinary to, for Capra to like him. If he's just a regular guy, maybe Capra wouldn't like him too much, and he didn't like average uh, uh, people of different ethnic groups or whatever. You know, he was a kind of a, a, a hard-hearted. It was fellow. reading your book. It was kind of like uh, you know finding out Santa Claus didn't exist. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I studied film and I didn't know um, Las Paul Capra. So uh, Pat Patrick, I I know you're dying to ask uh, <laughs> Professor McBride about yes, uh, favorite of yours. Yes, I got one. So uh, as a kid, I watched this with my dad and it was one of his favorite and my favorite Westerns. And I noticed you did an interview book on director Howard Hawk. So I wanted to ask you about uh, Rio Bravo, which has a great cast, Walter Brennan, who's in this and many other movies with John Wayne. It does such a great job in this movie. But um, Dean Martin is in that film, Angie Dickinson, Ricky Nelson. Um, any cool or interesting tidbit stories about uh, Rio yeah. Bravo uh, before just we let you go? Just to mention Walter Brennan, who's also in Meet John Doe. Absolutely. You know, one of the things today that we, people have trouble separating the art from the man or the woman. You know, like if you find out that some artist did something you didn't like, Woody Allen, Roman Polanski, whatever, that you don't want to watch his films. And sometimes it's, I mean, Polanski actually did what he's accused of and Woody Allen didn't, but people just, you know, can cancel culture. Walter Brennan was one of the biggest bigots in the history of Hollywood, and but he's a great, great character actor. He is always wonderful, you know, and he's so good in this film. But he's fantastic in Rio Bravo too. I mean, he's as stumpy. He's just great. But yeah, yeah. I'll just tell you my story. A couple stories that you find amusing. When I was twelve, I was a big Western fan. I went to see that film, and it was the first. I mean, I just love the film. It's a great screenplay. John Wayne, my favorite actor, and it's just a tremendous. A group of camaraderie, a lot of humor, and Robin Wood said if he could pick one film to justify the existence of Hollywood, he would pick Rio Bravo. Yeah. I also love El Dorado, the kind of remake that Hawks yeah. did. Yeah. But um, it, Rio Bravo really stunned me because I had alcoholic parents, and my life was very difficult at home. And in the film, Dean Martin is a very convincing alcoholic. He's mm -hmm. very, very good in that part. And there's a scene in which they're playing the Mexican. Uh, music that they played at the Alamo to buoy up their spirits, the de Guelo. And he, he's about to take a drink and he pours the drink back into the bottle. I'm sure you remember that moment. And I was so impressed by that. 
Uh, I never forgot that. That made a huge impression on me. And I, I think it was the first film I'd ever seen in which I recognized what I was going through in my daily life at home. This was such an accurate portrait of alcoholism. And, and I was really struck that a movie could do that to you, that rec you could recognize reality. But I told Hawks many years later when I did the interview book, Hawks on Hawks, I spent seven years interviewing him. He's a great raconteur. And I said, you know, I have to admit, I only went to that film because Ricky Nelson was in it and I was a Ricky Nelson yeah. fan. <laughs> and I didn't know who you were. And Hawks laughed and he said, well, I didn't know you appreciated music so much, you know. And uh, uh, I said, why did you cast Ricky Nelson, who is actually charming in the film, but he said, right, yeah. because because it meant $3 million gross in Japan. He's, he said in Japan, they had a picture of Ricky Nelson as big as one of John Wayne. And, you know, um, he, was, he was a bigger star even than like than Dean Martin over there in Japan? Or oh yeah, they probably good. didn't know much about Dean Martin, but Ricky Nelson was a huge, uh, he, he had that TV show where he was singing at the end of every show. and. He was a big uh, pop star. He's kind of like Montgomery Clift in uh, Red River, but uh, he's, he's not, you know, like a super actor, but he's charming and he has a wonderful song in the film. And uh, it's just Hawks, I, you know, I asked Hawks, why did you put the song in the film? People criticize it. I love that song that he sings with Dean Martin. And yeah, that's he says, good. That's great. That's great. You know, it's part of the camaraderie, as, as Wood says, it shows the love that these guys have for each other. But uh, Hawk says, well, you know, if you have a personality, your job is to use the personality. If somebody could do something, put it in the film. And Capra did that kind of thing, too. He would use people's that's that's what film acting is often about and it's it's often confused they think film acting is putting on a beard and having a phony accent or limping or whatever and it's uh, you know somebody who's just being himself like john wayne is is looked down on but to me he's the best my favorite film actor i mean there are a lot of great film actors but i asked john wayne on the set of the shoot us i said what do you think when people say you're just playing yourself and he said it's he says perfectly obvious it can't be done. He says if, if you if you're just yourself, you're the dullest son of a bitch who ever walked across the screen. Mm -hmm. And his son, his son um, Mike, producer, said, you know, my dad never played himself. He never played a rich movie star living in Beverly Hills. You know, yeah, he created real name with name John Wayne, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He created as Wayne said, and you know, he's a very intelligent man. He said, you create a persona, you create a character. He learned to do the walk. He learned to do the talk, and he said. Um, uh, you know, the, the the only trick I have is I'll pause in the middle of the sentence so you don't look away, and, and I won't pause at the end of the sentence so you don't look away. And that adds a certain vulnerability to the character. Now, Gary Cooper was the epitome of a kind of natural actor, and I uh, I was in a documentary about him, and uh, he didn't, he, he was well-educated, came from an affluent background, but um, I don't know how introspective or uh, you know intellectual he was i doubt it but there's a famous story about him that he was sitting on the set he would fall asleep because he was a big ladies man and he would get worn out i would hear stories about this he'd come to the set and pass out because he'd been up all night carrying on and he was sleep sleeping in his chair like this and the director said to the cameraman this is in the silent days he said just start shooting him you know so he shot a close-up of him and then he said, Gary, wake up. And Cooper woke up like this. And, and then they showed the rushes to Emil Jannings, who was the great histrionic actor at the time. And he said, that young man should play Hamlet. He had the most natural kind of wonderful physical presence and, and uh, behavior. You see that all through John Doe, which is a marvelous film. But, you know, we should talk a little bit about the political, uh, uh, the really important political content of this film. Uh, this was the period when we were not in the war yet in 41. Right. The, there was, you know, the war had started in 39, but Roosevelt was having trouble getting us into the war because the country was very isolationist. Yes. And there, there were a lot of uh, right wingers who were, um, well, there were neo Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. People didn't want war isolationists, uh, Charles Lindbergh, people like that. Right. And, um, but, um, there was there were people who had motorcycle gangs in Hollywood, like fascist motorcycle gangs, like Victor McLaughlin and other people. That's where they got that stuff for Norton. But he was a Hearst-like publisher who had come to support Hitler, and he was, um, you know, a very semi-fascistic guy. And so, as a warning from Capra and Risk, and it's a pretty brave film for 1941 about domestic fascism. And we've seen this in recent history, the last three or four months how this could happen again and how if we're not careful about democracy uh 
we could slip into this. And uh, he's he's a character who resembles uh, Trump to some extent, but also Rupert Murdoch, media mogul, or somebody like that. And um, uh, he, but he uses the ordinary people's naivete and goodness. You know, the, the idea of the Meet John Doe clubs is a uh, not a bad idea. It's love thy neighbor. It's a Christian thing. And I don't know, talk to your neighbor next door and you find out he's an okay guy. And I found it in the writing of this script, that was the scene that they had the hardest time writing. Riskin did many drafts of that speech in the radio station because they didn't want it to be too, you know, specifically political, but they wanted yeah. to have a political content. And he wrote it over and over again. And it's, it, it is somewhat uh, platitudinous, but it, it's all kind of real you know you kind of believe what he's saying and it's it's sort of the christian philosophy you apply to modern life and it and it uh, you care about it and then the you learn about the meet john doe clubs the john doe clubs from from the people who talk about their neighbors and stuff and, and it's fairly convincing but they're used by this uh, unscrupulous guy who doesn't care about ordinary people and then when john doe finds out about it willoughby he reacts against it. One of the greatest scenes in Capra is that scene in the bar with the uh, managing editor, James Gleason. My father was a newspaper man for a long time. And he said, James Gleason was the quintess quint quintessential managing editor in films. He's so great when he gets drunk and he talks about patriotism, it's so fantastic. He talks about, I really get mad for guys like Washington and Jefferson. Lighthouses, John, lighthouses in right. the foggy world. Capra, that was a, Capra phrase that Capra used a lot. I don't know if he got it from Riskin or whether he put it in, but it's a very moving scene and, and partly it works because he's drunk, you know. If it were more sober, it would seem a little too preachy, but he's kind of comical drunk. And, and then he has trouble lighting his cigarette and he's talking about how, how he has an ulcer, but he signals the bartender for another drink. It's just a great, great scene. And Capra was so great with character actors. We did a tribute on our AFI show to Capra and character actors. And he said, I treat every actor as a star, even if they have one minute of scene, I treat them as a star. And that really comes across in his films. There's so many wonderful people in his films, little parts, and he made them all really human and real. And that's a substantial part, but look at Regis Toomey and look at all kinds of other people that he puts in that film. They all come alive because he cared about each actor, you know, and that comes across. Well, thank you. We want to, we're right at eight o'clock and we want to um, thank you so much for being here, Professor McBride. Uh, we really appreciate it. You gave us so much insight and uh, maybe we'll get you back on a future show. I'd love to talk to your uh, audience and I hope they enjoyed it. And would love to talk about Orson Welles or John Ford or my other favorite directors or Spielberg, but it's been fun. Thank you for the good questions and thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, uh, uh, we want to let everybody know our next event is going to be on March 30th uh, at 6 p.m. for Loving Vincent. Uh, and that uh, Loving Vincent is an animated film. And that's going to be on Vincent Van Gogh's uh, birthday. So wear your favorite hat. I know Dave's got a couple picked out for that. Uh, <laughs> we um, also wanted to thank uh, a special shout out to the city of San Ramon for uh, all of their help for putting this together. We couldn't have done it without the city. And a special shout out to Brad Morris over there. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, and I wanted to thank all my foundation, uh, Santa Ramon Art Foundation members for all their help. And a, a very special shout out to uh, Gary and Donna. And of course, my co-host, Dave. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, last but not least, we wanna thank you, the most important, the audience for being here in our first show. So we uh, stumbled through it, but we got through it, everybody. So. <laughs> Uh, it's only yeah. up from here. <laughs> well, you yeah. guys, Dave and Patrick did a wonderful job and it was very, uh, kept the discussion going. There's so much to say. I wish we had more time, but hopefully people can read the books if they're interested. And uh, Capra is such really a fascinating man and a great American story. And uh, so I'm glad you saw the film and um, see more of his films. That's all I can say. They're all uh, fascinating. Thank you so much, Dave. You had something quickly you wanted oh, to Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, if you guys have any feedback, please let us know. You can always email us at samramonefilmclub at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at 925-786-0471. And if you enjoyed this event, we'd ask that you make a small donation to the San Ramon Arts Foundation at samramonarts.org. So thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. And thank we'll you. see you thank next you. month for Loving Vincent and Professor. Oh, one more thing before we let you go. 
we are going to have Professor Edwards, um, and he's written five books on Vincent Van Gogh. He's wow. a professor of religion and the arts at the Virginia Commonwealth in Richmond until his recent retirement in 2020. So hi, Professor Edwards. I think you're watching. We'll see you all on March 30th. Thank you, and goodbye. Thanks a lot, guys. See Appreciate you, everybody. It, see everybody. Thanks a lot. Yeah, nice take care. Talk. Nice talking to you.